3, 2, 1, go, live. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, our apologies, medyo nahuli po tayo ng start this afternoon because um, of some technical problems. We're still waiting for our, one of our resource persons to join us. But anyway, thank you very much uh, for all your um, chat to us, asking if we're already on and telling us that you're still waiting and you're interested to join us um, until we finish our today's session. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we would like to welcome you all to the DTI Philippine Trade Training Center webinars. And this is the episode three of Bouncing Back. Um, yes, Bouncing Back, a shared future in a shared world. Okay. Um, I can't see my screen. Here you go. Okay. Bouncing Back, a shared future in a shared world. So we're actually be joined, we will be joined this afternoon by three resource persons. But before we finally go into our, um, you know, webinar proper. Okay, here we go. Still making some adjustments after a week of going on air. Okay, anyway, uh, we'd like you to be uh, joining us in all the activities that we're doing here during the webinar. Uh, as I was saying early on, we'll have poll questions. This is the question that you have now on your screen. Did you encounter challenges in developing DCP and disaster crisis preparedness plan? Uh, your choices can be no, or if yes, lack of awareness of the importance of developing DCP and disaster preparedness plan. Yes, lack of knowledge on how to develop these plans. Yes, lack of management support, or yes again, our company does not have the capacity to develop these plans. So again, uh, please join us as we will be showing the result of the polls uh, before the end of this webinar this afternoon. Just type bit.ly slash poll BB day three, and uh, it will bring you to that part. And last week, just to uh, update you, although we have already uploaded this in the website of PTTC Jimea, where you can see what transpired. I mean, it's the whole thing that we did last week, the, the, the very coverage or we covered everything. And we're just very happy because uh, Mr. Mon Abrea, who was one of our resource person, was uh, also able to publish this. This actually came out in one of the national dailies. So if we just go back, you say Alma, it says here, uh, among those that they were proposing is for a general tax amnesty. I think this is a very welcome information to all of us. And I hope the government, especially the, those policymakers, would consider these suggestions. There's also a suggestion that to lower corporate income tax from 30% to 25%. And next is tax credit or rebate for employees. And uh, tax holidays for MSMEs and no audit program for large taxpayers. I think this. Um, uh, details of this were discussed last time, and if you are interested to uh, to find out how these were explained, please just log on to our uh, Facebook account of the PTTC Jimea, or another access or information can actually be taken from, um, I think it's the Daily Inquirer where this is published. And also, among the topics that were discussed last week was uh, this one, transitioning back to conditional operation, and I think it was no less than Yusek Alma, who is also the ASEAN Society of Philippines president, who discussed to us calibrating operations, preparing for the office return, addressing workforce issue, and managing health concerns. We were actually even asked at PTTC, and I think a lot of people who were watching last time were also very interested because it was a step-by-step -step process on how to get back, how to prepare the staff, how to prepare the office, and how to, you know, address issues that will be faced by uh, the people or the workforce are already going back to their respective offices. And for those who are interested to get copies of this, as I was saying, uh, for those who registered and were able to complete uh, our call, um, client satisfaction feedback, we will be email emailing this straight to you. Okay. Or there are some people who are, are already taking screenshot of the presentation. 
I mean, that's that's yeah, the fastest way of doing it because you can already get hold of copies of it. Okay, so our topic for today would actually be covering stabilizing learning to live again, economic impact of COVID, tourism and travel prospects. It's all about trust, disruptions can breed innovation. And we have as our resource persons, our former USEC Almarita Jimenez, Alec Francis Santos, and of course, Mr. Mori Rodriguez, who I hope can uh, eventually join us here. But uh, we won't um, make this long because I think we're also catching up time. So at this time, we would like once again to welcome you all and turn over the floor to our resource person, starting off with Yusek Alma for the first topics. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we'd like to welcome you all. This is Bouncing Back, shared um, for the shared future with no less than Yusek Alma joining us for our first speaker. Yes, Yusek Alma. Hello, Nelly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we start, no, I just we learned, of course, this morning the sad news that uh, former DOT Secretary Moni Menes passed on today. So maybe we should just uh, offer a moment of silence for his service to the country, especially to the tourism sector. Let's offer a prayer for him. Okay, thank you very much. I, I know that we all uh, wish him eternal repose. We will pray for him. So may I just share this now? So are you getting the screen already, Nelly? Are you getting the yes, screen now? Good. Okay, it's there. Yes, yes. look at it's there. Thank you. So welcome to the third and final installment of our webinar series on bouncing back, preparing for a shared future in a changed world. The two past webinars were building blocks to this last part. We recognize two types of patients in this pandemic, those that are experiencing physical pain and those undergoing financial pain, and that applies to both individuals and enterprises. So we had a situation here in day one that sought to give a picture on where we are in our COVID crisis and what financial relief are available. For that, we are thankful for the insights shared by our two distinguished speakers, Joey Bermudez and Dr. Benji Ko. And I know we are looking forward to pick up the threads of our lives back again. And, th and though the ECQ is extended once more, at least in those places we call hotspots, we need to get down to preparing ourselves and our enterprises to transition our businesses in a changed world. And the Philippines tax with Raymond Abrea shared his recommendations on tax breaks, as Nelly mentioned, that if all these are considered and implemented, it will surely inject transfusion into, a hem into our hemorrhaging enterprises. My part was to share with you activities that can be done while on ECQ and what tasks we should prepare for in reopening our businesses once again. We will provide the participants with checklists and templates that can be used as a guide so we can just tick off those boxes as we move along. And today is your day of completion, especially for those who joined us from day one. It's a walkthrough that asks the question, where are we now? And I hope that day two answered the question, what we ought to prepare for and that it is best if we now use our ECQ time to start the phase in and taking a second look at our operations to see if the things we are doing still makes sense in this changed world. Today will also be about finding some answers to the burning question of where do we go from here? Well, given that we only have two hours and we may not be able to discuss as comprehensively as we want, Let's start with the germ of ideas that we can then think about concretizing. And we still have a half a month anyway. But first, let's see where the land lies in the world, regional and local economy. What challenges are there and what we can brace ourselves for in the next few months or maybe even a year or two after. But just to manage your expectations before we proceed, I know that you must have seen and heard so many status reports 
predictions, projections, forecasts, even fake news about where the world economy is headed post-pandemic. That means one thing, your guess is as good as mine or ours. Many of those uh, used forecasting tools and algorithms, but in the end, who really knows? The materials used in, for these presentations were lifted from various sources that included those from McKinsey and Company, Pricewaterhouse, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, etc. What we did was to pick up those relevant to the discussions, serving as basis to provide a good snapshot of where tourism industry is situated. And finally, the analysis and conclusions were our own appreciation of the various information from this data and, there's, and other sources and distilled so that we have a basis for discussions. That means conclusions or interpretations, yours and mine may differ, even using the same data source because of this subjective perspective. COVID-19 is the ultimate traveler. From a handful of localized cases in Wuhan, China that came out in the news last November 28th of 2019, it has since spread quickly around the world. It is an unseen force that figuratively halted the earth in its axis, put the world in virtual paralysis and causing disastrous economic impact. That is all the more scary because we do not even know the extent of the damage until the virus decides to settle down. One thing is sure, it drove people out of the street and literally confined everyone to their quarters. The global count is now nearing 3 million and even then we are not even sure if these are underreported because of the fact that the testing has been slow and reporting of the data inconsistent. Confirmed cases are approaching 3 million and currently standing standing at uh, two point, sorry, a 2.9 out of the world population of 7.7 .7 billion. All these statistics are beset by discrepancies in how countries report data, plus the testing limitations, which means the real figures are likely to be higher. And while the rise in count continues, the good news is that it seems to be slowing down a bit. Countries are starting to cautiously test the waters if they can relax some of the restrictions that have been imposed to prevent widespread infections. However, the great damage on the world economy has been done. IMF's forecast is a contraction of minus 3%, a downgrade of 6.3% from January 2020. Ang bilis ng panahon, tatlong buwan lang. They opined that this makes the great lockdown the worst recession since the Great Depression and far worse than the global crisis in 2009. The cumulative loss to global GDP over 2020 and 2021 from the pandemic crisis could be around $9 trillion, greater than the economies of Japan and Germany combined. Should the pandemic start to be resolved by the second half of the year, and that means the actions being taken by all the countries will be effective in implementing interventions that will arrest bankruptcies, job losses, and other financial stresses. IMF expects a rebound to 5.8% in 2021. Will that happen? Well, your guess is as good as mine again, considering that stimulus plans and financial assistance have yet to move from discussion to action. The silver lining is that Asian 5, that means Limatayo, who first started ASEAN, appears to be in a little bit better position than the rest of the countries in the region. This outlook appears to confirm what Central Bank Governor Ben Jokno said. The domestic economy could slow down in the first quarter of 2020 and is projected to contract in the second and third quarters before gradually recovering in the fourth quarter of 2020. He expects the GDP to shrink by 0.2% before it bounces back to approximately 7.7% when government measures kick in. Of course, this is predicated on us being able to put this COVID-19 pandemic in control. The bottom line, economic recovery will only happen after the public health recovery. So even in this global crash scenario, are there gainers and losers? Well, offhand, Zoom, Netflix, Disney, the, the streaming services will probably land on top 
with Netflix reporting actually 16 million new subscribers, not to mention the manufacturers of PPEs. And yes, maybe even the healthcare facilities because at least the private ones, they are overloaded with patients. McKinsey and company published results of their studies and of particular interest are their scenario planning that calibrated possible outcomes depending on the mix of the infection spread, meaning it's, it's an interplay between virus spread and the public health response. The response of the public health system and the injection of economic measures. Even in a scenario where the virus can be contained, you will still note in this slide the degree of impact and the extent of the decline of the sectors. You could see this in this uh, graph, the highest being travel, transport and logistics and going down to the moderate low of consumer and retail. From the industry most affected to the ones that will suffer moderate to low impact. Should the most likely scenario happen, a muted recovery, the impact will still be pessimistic. Experts say hoping for a return to normal is being overly optimistic. When we start to have conditional freedom, restaurants may still remain closed, large gatherings will still be disallowed, and travel will continue to be restricted. And we will likely stay in this space until vaccines become available, and that's probably at the earliest the second half of 2021. Tourism and travel sector is one of the hardest hits. We may be on the same boat with the, with, both with the restaurants and malls that are closed, the property owners that cannot collect rent or the layoffs and the retren uh, retrenchments that will cause loss of jobs and therefore consumer spending. Our tourism and travel boat will have less wind on its sails and its entire value chain, hotel industry, airline industry, and so on, we will not be returning to anything close to normal this year. And we may even be the last to adapt to a new normal yet to come. And so prudence dictates that we go and prepare for a long, hard climb. Just consider the latest report of the UNWTO that says 96% of the planet's destinations have imposed travel restrictions. And according to the Global Review, 90 destinations or countries, territories or states have completely or partially closed, closed their borders to tourists. While 44% of destinations are close to certain groups of tourists depending on the country of origin. Tourism has gone through several crises, but it seems all will pale in comparison to the effect of the COVID pandemic. UNWTO expects a decline in international tourist arrivals by 1-3%, to 3 down from the estimate of 3-4% to 4 estimated growth in January of 2020. It seems like, you know, history, because I was reading this uh, study in January 2020. It was very, very optimistic, and now this would translate to an estimated loss of 30 to 50 billion dollars in international visitor spending. Again, Asia Pacific will suffer most with a decrease of 9 to 12 percent in arrivals. And even without this, the projected impact can really cause depression with potential travel and tourism GDP loss of up to 2.1 trillion dollars in 2020. 75 million jobs going to be immediately at risk with almost 1 million job uh, losses. The Asia Pacific region with the most impact with 49 million jobs at risk and a loss of uh, 800, $800 billion. And IATA estimated a drop of $314 billion in global revenues. That comes from the statistics of World Travel and Tourism Council. And even without those, stop, that, those stats, we know by gut feel, we are actors in this movie. We can feel the effect. And if this chart is anything to go by, the hospitality sector reflects the sentiment. The feeling is only a swing from unsure to pessimistic. If you will notice tung mga ibang uh, categories in your chart, you will see that hospitality is the only one without blue. Wala siyang optimism at all. The hospitality sector's take on this impact of travel restrictions and the hastening of the transfer to digital platforms will definitely hamper their ability to recover post-COVID. So, 
given this scenario, I'm sure our thought bubble is, so what are we doing here planning? Are we planning for our funeral? So, di naman. We are cracking our heads in search of solutions because we all want to survive this pandemic and get our lives back and get our businesses back on track. And because our businesses contribute to the national economy, both public and private sectors need to come together in search for ways out of this intensive care unit. It's a health crisis that will metastasize in the economy. So I thought it is quite appropriate to borrow some medical terms to classify solutions that we need to put in the table. Namely, first we talk about palliative or pain relievers. So when you have flu or colds, whether you like it or not, it will follow its course. So the only thing that's left for us to do when we have these uh, uh, conditions is to just come up with palliatives, meaning uminom ka ng mga gamot that will just relieve your pain or ease up the symptoms. And then the next stop would be, pag hindi pa rin gumaling, di quick, quick fixes ulit, no, I'm sorry, curative antibiotics. We treat and manage the causes of the problem by prescribing a regimen of steps that should be taken. And finally, we go for preventive or maintenance, meaning we plan strategies and implement actions that will inoculate or vaccinate us from future occurrences. Or at least, pag nag nangyari ulit in the future, wag naman sana, it will only mildly hurt the enterprise when it happens again. So what are these palliatives or quick fixes already on the table? Well, we have some from DOT, like they talked about moratorium on the collection of accreditation fees for 2020, then the waived participation fees in international fairs and exhibitions between now into the end of 2021. They've been in touch for a possible financing from support from Development Bank of the Philippines and the Land Bank of the Philippines. Uh, low interest rates for tourism enterprises that had been badly hit by the pandemic. So I think DBP has identified the tourism industry as qualified for its rehabilitation support program on severe events and also Land Bank, which aims to provide financing through low interest loans to businesses, usually hit hard by calamities. Land Bank will also help tourism stakeholders through its rehabilitation support to cushion and favorably affected enterprises or the iRescue lending program. Some other, uh, some other things that they're doing is coordinating with the social security system, but even field health for the deferment of tourism workers contribution. They've asked the BIR, although of course the BIR already deferred the collection of uh, income tax, but it, this will only be, uh, this will be due 30 days after the lifting of the quarantine. I think that was the information shared to us by Mon Abrea when he talked last time. And they also want to raise to the Congress the possibility of passing legislations for fiscal stimulus program for the travel industry, which include rent and utility discounts, higher commissions from airlines, as well as salary and travel for tour export subsidies. There is now a stimulus plan being uh, discussed in Congress to help the industry. And this one is authored by um, Congressman Joey Salceda, Congressman uh, Sharon Green, and Congressman Stella Kimbo. And uh, I think the Committee on Tourism will be asking for inputs from the tourism industry also what they think uh, should be part of this uh, stimulus plan. I hope it comes soon because the industry is not only bleeding, as I said, it is hemorrhaging. And while I classified this as quick fixes, there are limits, especially if the actions on this depend on the approval of others. Maybe we need to think a little more uh, hard about quick fixes whose sole decision to approve and implement will be within the authority of the department. But maybe that's, uh, that's a topic for another webinar. Moving on, there are also some op uh, options we may consider, such as applying for small business loans, in addition to the disaster loans, which only apply to businesses now that have declared emergency status. But maybe there will be preferential loans 
and also to explore private sector programs because I know that FinTech said it would offer 100 million in grants to small businesses and uh, other FinTech companies would want to uh, contribute by giving special uh, loans to small businesses. And though these are global companies, I think they are open to receiving also applications from various countries. We can also renegotiate terms of contracts and debts and owners should ask landlords for more time to pay for their rent. And I, these were all covered actually by the uh, discussions of Joey Bermudez in day one. She, he talked about financial institutions, what can be done by these groups as well as government. And um, of particular interest to me was his suggestion to create a recovery fund that, uh, you know, that can be funded by people from overseas. We're not talking about the OFW, but he says the 60% of the 11 million Filipinos who are now residing outside of the country are actually immigrants in those countries and they have extra savings that they could probably uh, lend at preferential rate, especially to their home country at this time. And I will add a few suggestions. I don't know if uh, if possible, but uh, we could also talk about travel gift certificates. Um, if we have people, especially the large enterprises, who are anyway finding themselves uh, uh, not not affected too much by this um, ECQ because their businesses continue to thrive despite the crisis, they might think about. Uh, purchasing travel gift certificates or pre-bought by those who want to help the industry recover by injecting cash flow into the system. Hindi ito utang, but rather injection of cash flow bibilika for future services that you will render. Or pay bills now or in advance. Kung may utang sila sa inyo, sana bayad sila kaagad to inject liquidity into the system. Then, we move on to the curatives, how to treat and manage the problem step by step so that we can fully recover down the road. For this, I find this, uh, for this, I find uh, the one that you're seeing right now, this advice particularly resonant. It says we have to rediscover business building. The companies that emerge stronger from the COVID-19 pandemic will be the business builders. They understand that customer behaviors and needs will change. They will build new businesses to respond to these changes. They know that the industry boundaries will evolve and that they will build new businesses to lead and control those new profit pools. What are some things that we can do? Take a new perspective on how our business operates. Restudy the market, take note of the trends and see where the industry is headed. Of course, nakikita natin lahat ng mga forecast, nakikita natin lahat ng mga sinasabi sa atin. Pero meron bang pwede nating minahin out of those data? Mind the data and see how uh, attitudes, how preferences, where the gaps are so that we will see kung anong mga opportunities ang maring nandun. We review also operations and see how it will change in the new normal. For sure, hindi na tayo babalik sa dating operations. So what are we seeing right now sa operation natin that we can probably streamline, inject more efficiency, or how will we do things differently? Downtime does not mean waste time. It still is best to keep in constant touch with your clients and customers, not only to find out how they are doing, but also to apprise them about your own operations and how you are still there ready to assist in their requirements. Uh, iniisip natin busy-busy -busy tayong lahat ano, because it's uh, downtime. But really, the, the truth is we, we have to find out from our customers also na, oh, kumusta na kayo dyan? Ano nangyayari sa inyo? It's just, just to show that uh, we also worry about them, that the, we are not just their friends during the times that we get business from them, but that they are also our friends during those times na mahirap ang buhay. And what I'm saying is that um, it does not mean that you, you, you have to spend for this or anything. It's just a show of empathy and sympathy and that uh, at least the assurance and comfort that you're all there for one another, that you're all in the same boat, and that you're optimistic that in time, we will all recover and that you get it, you understand. Communication, 
builds trust. I don't know, is, is Mori already on uh, online? Hello? <laughs> yes, uh, I use still accessing music. Okay. So Hope that he, we can have him in. So so I could I could uh, introduce him already. Not yet, you said not yet. Oh, because he's he's supposed to be the next uh, next one to talk. Uh, how how long will it take for him to I uh, know to get his uh, his uh, uh, presentation online? Siguro ano, what we can do Nelly is while we're waiting for him to go online because uh, it will uh, it will interrupt kasi the flow if uh, if I move on to the rest of the no? why, why don't we find out if the the audience have uh, some at this point will have some questions before we start with uh, with Mori. Okay, uh -huh. Okay, we're still waiting for Mori, but anyway, there are four questions already online. Number uh -huh. 1 is Subject. China is presenting the country as a safe destination to visit now. They will proceed with trade events. Is that true? Uh, I don't. Well, they can do it. And I, you're, you're not really very sure about China all the time. They can they can do it. But uh, the question really is whether they can get people to attend because doing events is not going yes. to be very difficult. The problem is getting people to come in. Will we will we have enough confidence to go to China and uh, uh, attend their events? I don't know. Your answer is uh, well as good as mine. I'll ask you, do you want to go to China right now to attend events? Personally, I won't. So I don't know about the others. So it's not the holding of the event that will be the problem. It's actually whether some pe whether people they can get people to come and attend. Yes. Okay. So here's another question. How about local tourism? When do you expect it to pick up? <laughs> local tourism. Lamo, I I would really like to be optimistic and uh, echo the the the. What we call this echo the forecast of Central Bank Governor Ben Jokno, where he says we will recover by the end of the year. The assumption kasi is that uh, we will be able to put a stop to this and to this uh, infection spread, or at least that the public health system will be managing it. But I think I mentioned in one of my slides that economic recovery will follow public health recovery, which means nothing will happen until we are all sure that uh, when we go out, it's safe to go out in the streets and we are not going to be infected anymore. So if we manage muna nila yung aspect na yun, then we can get down to really forecasting when is it possible to bounce back. In I, I tend to believe some of the, the materials I, I read and I know sasabi ng iba, this is very pessimistic because ang, ang, ano, ang kanilang sinasabi is that the, the, we can only go back to pre-COVID uh, market by 2023. Pero personally, if I am in the, in the planning group and I, I am advising companies as, a, as their strategy consultant, I always say that you don't prepare for good times, see? You prepare for bad times. Because remember Nelly, when we used to work with DOT, isa yan sa mga lagi kung sinasabi when we have meetings sa regional offices. Why should we prepare for good times? Darating yan, masaya tayong lahat sa good times. We always prepare for the bad times. And if I have to do a planning scenario, I will assume the worst. Because if 10% of the worst happens, tip maganda, masaya tayong lahat. Pero kung worse naman ang nangyari, there is nothing in that, uh, well, at least konti na lang in that planning scenario that I have not considered and I have not predicted in any way inasahan ko to. So hindi ako masyadong matataranta. So if I were to go for assumptions, I'll go for that assumptions. And if if that is cut, masaya. Pero kung hindi, handa ako. Parang mas gusto ko yung ganong klaseng mindset. So my, my answer, okay. my quick answer there is, sorry, Ang sinasabi nila is 2023, earliest. Pre-COVID, okay. hindi ko naman so, sinasabing hindi siya magpipick up. Pre-COVID rate, para umakyat tayo dun sa pre-COVID uh, uh, 
uh, numbers natin, it might be by that period tayo makaabot ulit doon. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in as much as marami talaga tayong, we have assisted a lot of, you know, LGUs and even private institutions to set up their own destinations. I, I think that's the very reason why they're asking that. Kasi kung baga established now, we have a lot of established destinations. But I think the very reason or one of the important things that we're looking at right now is yung health issues. But otherwise, mm -hmm. we can have all these destinations, but people won't be able to go there because, you know, of health uh, sickness and all that. Okay, another question, you said, what are, or what is FinTech? You mentioned something about FinTech uh, early on. Yeah. Uh, kasi, uh, in, in, in my researches, kasi, kasi daming mga, naka, I, I was looking really for, for innovative ideas and uh, out of the box thinking because I think uh, we all agree that this, uh, this COVID is really out of the box. Wala siya sa, wala siya sa planning horizon natin, ni sabi nga natin, ni sa panaginip hindi natin inisip na mangyayari to sa atin. And uh, the other day, I was in a conversation with uh, one of my friends, uh, one of the leaders in the industry, sabi pa nga niya sa akin eh, naku naman, sabi niya ganyan, matanda na tayo, senior citizens na tayo, sana hindi na natin inabot to. Sana dumating na lang siya after 20 years. Parang hindi ko type mag, mag problema na naman ngayon for the business. But it is what it is. I read kasi that some of the big corporations, well, that included also some of the non-government uh, agencies, like for example, the Bill Gates uh, Foundation, some are are uh, redirecting their funding so that they will be offered uh, be able to offer grants to small businesses and that means uh, siguro uh, kailangan lang re related ng konti sa kanilang operation because if you talk about fintechs and if you talk about uh, uh, fin fin uh, what you call technology companies dapat may relevance ng konti sa technology and i think the biggest thing that they uh, that they want to put their money on is how fast we can do the digital transformation. So I think as we all review some of our strategies, which alam nyo, I'll take this up later and you know, innovations, but uh, let me just give uh, a little bit of an answer. Yung digital transformation is something that will interest many of the tech companies. So if we can leverage our business model so that it goes through spaces where this the uh, implementing digital technologies and transformation is now possible in a business uh, in a business environment they would want to finance uh, models that would uh, that would exhibit that kind of willingness among the business enterprises to see and experiment in this new space so inaaral ko pa to but don't worry i will tell nelly so that she can inform you about uh, some of these developments. I am closely following these developments because I think may, mas meron siyang ano, kinabukasan because I'm looking at uh, new business models, not necessarily change in industry, but what are the things that are happening in industry that is changing the behavior of the traveler na pwede nating magkaroon ng gap na pwede tayong pumasok doon kasi bakante siya ngayon. And anyway, back to zero naman tayong lahat. Business remodeling is not out of the out and uh, not out of consideration so those are the things that i am referring to but uh, let me just mention them more uh in, de in detail uh yung sa fintech kasi medyo bago pa yan ano? but but uh, some of these things that you're asking nandun siya sa last part natin before alex which are the innovations and breakthroughs so i will just park that issue there okay. and let me just study it further Okay, uh, maybe just for the information of those who just joined or even those who do not know Yusek Alma well, she used to be the Undersecretary of the Department of Tourism and uh, of course she's an official of the Management Association of the Philippines and President of the ASEAN Society of Philippines. And we've got another question here. Is it possible for those prospective hospitality providers like those who were or who are still in the process of building their hotels Etc. So, uh, related to hospitality, when the COVID crisis struck, to avail of the possible aids or assistance from the government to the hospitality industry. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Kasi nandun na kayo, naka invest na kayo ng pera, and I think you will be also given a priority so that th th they wouldn't like to lose those investments. But uh, let me again put uh, another spin to that. If you're still building your 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 hospitality facilities. Maybe uh, you look 
your planning horizon should be beyond also COVID. And I know that you will have problems about financing, but it's something that uh, that could be remedied. But what I'm saying is you have now a very good opportunity to play in a different market. And what is that market? Again, I will mention this one as innovations, but let, let me just give you an advice. Now is the time to consider restructuring your facilities so that you have isolation areas. Nisabihin, when we say, uh, let's look at our operation in your perspective, biro nyo, meron kayong opportunity ngayon to segregate and isolate areas so that when crisis like this happens, you're the only facility that is ready actually to bring in, let's say, infected individuals, etc. Kasi nakaklose ang mga ano nyo, meron kayong I mean, sabihin, konting design, ano lang to, konting design management lang ito. But in the future, and I'll tell you, in, not just in the future, but in quickly, very quickly, when we lower our our restrictions on travel, the first thing that your customers would want to know is how safe are we in your facilities? And the safety could be guaranteed by physically uh, renovating your spaces so that they see, you know, how, how, how good your safety and hygiene uh, mechanism and protocol will be. And if you're just putting up your your hotels, that's a very, very good opportunity right now to construct it in such a way that it provides for that safety. And I think uh, that's the way to go because the moment you open, you're the only one qualified to do that and you will get the market. Yeah, thank you very much. That's uh, That question was actually from Glenn B. Thank you very much, Glenn B. Um, Okay, here's another one. We have an event, the Philippine Coffee Expo, which was supposed to be held last April 2 to 3 at SMX Davao. We post hello, mga taga Davao. We postponed the event to September 28th. Do you think this is feasible given the current situation or do you advise to move it to 2021? Okay, I want to uh, ask you, Sek Alma, to answer this. Please uh, stand by on Friday. We hope to bring in the director of the Bureau of Domestic Trade Promotion of the VTI to tell our MSMEs, especially those who are participating in national and even international trade fairs, to join us and get information about how we are going or what we're, where we are going as far as uh, you know national trade fairs and international trade fairs are concerned. Okay, Yusek, uh, here's another one. Maybe we will have two more questions because more is already in. Uh, Clarissa here says the GCQ lists that tourism can open only in September. If Manila lifts ECQ in May and turns to D GCQ, does this mean travel agencies are closed until September? <laughs> well, uh, I th th this is how I'm going to answer that. I don't think we have any option because as long as travel restrictions are there, picking up the pieces is still very difficult, whether it's whether even if we lift it now, if the other countries, if the other locations are not ready to bring in tourists and bring in visitors to their places, I don't think we even could function even if we are open as a business. So my 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 uh, answer there is really to make sure that uh, uh, again, as I said, I will discuss it uh, at the at, after Morris presentation, but there are some things that we can do in the meantime to make sure that we start preparing for this. So maybe I could just answer this after after the presentation of Mori, and I'll take the last question, Nelly. Okay, this time from Jerome. Hello, Jerome. What are your thoughts about the report that tourism industry will open in September as ayan, a new ayan, player ayan. in travel? Yeah, but but mm. but there's a rejoinder. As a new player, as a new player in travel and tour industry, what are your advices in order to stay with the business and to retain the employees? Uh, the, the, the retention of employees uh, will really depend on the policies of the policies of the enterprises. And uh, I think Mori will will uh, will be discussing some of this about uh, how how some companies have managed to uh, know, to come up with policies and programs during the ECQ that is uh, really for the retention of the workforce, but uh, it depends because on how you will see your business uh, moving forward and whether you have even if you like to retain all your employees, if your business model has changed, if your systems has changed, and also if your affordability has changed. I think there are some adjustments that you need to make. So um, if you attended day two 
or if you didn't, you can watch it uh, via the uploads. We actually uh, gave a lot of inputs about how to to manage your workforce at the time of uh, lifting ng ano ng ECQ, right, Nelly? Yes. So yes, teacher. So I will just. Okay, there's I something just, on the screen. <laughs> huh? Yeah. So there, I will just. There's something uh, on the screen. Yeah, I will just share something para to introduce uh, Mori. Okay. Oh, siguro hindi ko siya tatang... Yeah, hindi, I will not remove it anymore kasi baka mawala si Mori. So, I will just say yeah, that... Uh, I will just say that... Uh, wait a minute. Actually, Con uh, there's... Okay. Yeah, there's a question. There's a question here from Jim. I think this is also a good transition to the presentation of Mori. Sabi niya, with regards to marketing Philippine tourism, what will be the new normal? You said, um, I think that's a good way of introducing uh, Mori now. If yeah. you have details on introducing him, yes. Yeah. Uh, I am supposed to uh, to say something about uh, this. Anyway. But it I think the, my last my, my last uh, my last slide was something about uh, it's still best to keep in contest constant touch with your clients and customers and communication builds trust and trust as they say is the most stable currency as we navigate the new normal. This is a very important component of building back better business. So on that note, I will give way to someone who can talk about this trust building better. He is the chief innovation officer of the Eon Group, the country's largest independent Filipino-owned communications consultancy, which has been around for 22 years. Maury's career has spent 20 years in media and marketing communications, and he's a pioneer of digital and continues to lead Eon's transformation across multiple disciplines, which includes creatives, research and analytics, corporate development, and training and development. So let us all welcome Maury Rodriguez. Take it away, Maury. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Can you hear me well? Yes, loud and clear. Hi, hi, hi. good afternoon. Sorry for, hi. for the technical Last. difficulty. Yes, I'm very honored to be here today to talk about what we live by as a company. Um, and this is trust and how businesses like yours can leverage on it to remain relevant with your audiences. Uh, but before that, uh, let me just tell you about the company that I represent. So as Yusek Alma said, I am Mario Rodriguez. I am the Chief Innovation Officer of the Eon Group. We are an integrated marketing communication consultancy that has been around for 22 years. We are proud of the journey taken all these years from a small Makati-based office to becoming the first Filipino communications firm to open up shop in the United Arab Emirates. And our business is to build, cement, and deepen the trust for and the reputation of our clients. In the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about the value trust, especially in a situation like ours right now, as we face a global pandemic and witness the most massive disruption businesses have seen in decades. To start, let's talk about the ways in which crisis can impact brands today. The first is something more apparent, which many of us now are likely feeling, especially those in high-touch industries such as travel and tourism, restaurants and events. With enhanced community quarantine, establishments have closed. Many operations have ceased because of disruptions in the supply chains, and marketing plans have been put on hold with the cancellation of events, which used to be the centerpiece of our experience economy. On the flip side, some businesses are experiencing the exact opposite and are getting even greater demand than they have forecasted. But that doesn't necessarily mean immediate success for a business. Reputations could take a hit as consumers clamor for access to what they deem as essential goods during this time, and businesses scramble to continue providing access as travel becomes increasingly limited. No matter where the spectrum your business falls, there is disruption in at least one area of your operations. These disruptions threaten our short-term survival or fully creep into negative impacts in the long term. Let me share with you some insights we even covered as E.ON on how this crisis has impacted business and public behavior. 
the first is that people are keeping a more watchful eye on the movements of brands and personalities, especially with social media becoming a potent microphone for them to express what they think and feel. At the beginning of the enhanced community quarantine, personalities who expressed their anger over people who continued to go to work or complained about the policies that were set were called out for their privilege and insensitivity to the plight of those in need. So brands are also expected to act with added sensitivity to the anxieties of its customers. This is a time when people are panicking over access to the basic essentials and expect brands to deliver on these. Second, we've seen an opportunity for brands and businesses to thrive by innovating their offerings and showing compassion. There is no playbook for anyone facing this kind of crisis. And while that can feel daunting, it's also an opportunity to go back to your mission as a business and find new ways to fulfill that mission. Providers of essential goods and services have innovated to bring their business online, such as supermarkets and even medical clinics. Restaurants are delivering take-home packs of favorite dishes. Fast food chains are putting their favorites up for sale on supermarkets so customers can continue to fulfill their cravings. We've seen brands pave their own paths in marketing and operations as well, such as Coca-Cola and Ligo, reallocating their marketing budgets for COVID-19 relief efforts. And even smaller businesses are, talk, are taking to social media, finding ways and through Facebook groups to connect with customers, to update them on store schedules or available products, and to coordinate with logistics providers to deliver goods to them. Finally, we're seeing a greater focus on meaningful and emphatic communication, both from brands and notable personalities alike. This is actually one of the points we always give our clients during a crisis. With so much uncertainty happening around us, there is a growing demand for transparency. In the context of a global pandemic, communicating with transparency is vital to our survival as a society, an effective way to dispel fake news and their credibility as an organization. During this crisis, the public also expects decisive actions from companies and their leaders. We always tell our clients, you cannot control what happens during a crisis, but you can control what to do about it. It cannot be more true in the case of COVID-19 where decisiveness shows your, share, your stakeholders that you are committed to remaining valuable to them. In relation to that, our clients also expect us to be agile in order for us to stay relevant. When we are upfront about our mistakes and lapses in judgment, we eventually are forgiven as long as we provide quick solutions and use our learnings to bounce back. As we fight these different fires, we need to make sure that protecting our reputation remains a guiding principle to ensure we make it to the other side of this. How we act now, no matter how big or small our business, will influence how much our public will trust us. And trust will define our survival and even success in the future. Because as Yusek Alma said, trust is undoubtedly a critical factor in crisis. Its presence constitutes a major capital for organizations and leaders, one that can be leveraged on to bounce back and recover faster in the aftermath. Conversely, its absence will dictate how long a time they will need to regain lost ground if they survive at all. So how can we stay in the minds of our clients right now while we're on ECQ? And there are still so many literal and figurative roadblocks that keeps us from connecting with them. Allow me to end this uh, brief presentation with a few uh, tips uh, and I will give examples of each. So the key to earning and maintaining client trust in the time of ECQ is to be at least one of these qualities. Be helpful, be useful, and uplift the spirits of our public. I think you will see very specific examples of these three tenets 
in some of the more active and agile brands on social media today. Uh, you know, Zen offered its hotel branch in Quiapo to accommodate Red Cross volunteers and frontliners during the lockdown. McDonald's also opened its used its platform and its network to be able uh, to offer meals to its frontliners and uh, the affected communities. And Crew Life UK also launched a uh, free COVID-19 protection for Filipinos through health through their health app called Pulse. So what this means is to be helpful is to be able to leverage on your network and your platform as a company to either provide credible and truthful information to the public, to provide resources that are deemed to be essential in this day, and of course, uh, be able to use your partnerships for the betterment, not only of your direct customers, but everyone in the entire ecosystem. It can also be useful, uh, and we've seen a lot of brands that the done this pen shop uh, currently works with their vendor partners to produce PPEs for distribution amongst health workers. Lazada, of course, launched its uh, Laz for Good program to provide Filipinos a way to donate in cash or kind. And Ligo also partnered with Ancas to ensure faster distribution of PPEs to hospitals that are running out of supplies. So just like being helpful, this tenet allows the different companies to be able to look deep into its supply chain and see, okay, what can we tap within our supply chain and convert it so that we can, you know, be be useful and be, uh, you know, be be of help to the the citizens all over the country. Uh, however, however small or large the contribution might be. And third is to uplift. I think there is no question about this. We've seen a lot of brands and even influencers really putting a stop to hard selling their influence and also their products and services because this is not a time to overly sell yourself. This is a time to to really take a look at the the the, the bigger picture and realize that for privilege, a lot of the Filipinos, a lot of the people in general are suffering uh, compared to our situation. So the brands now look at look at their, their inner mission and vision as Netflix, for instance, continues to engage its audience with feel good and casual content, helping them cope with the current situation. So it's not hard sell, but it still promotes and extends, you know, the network's platform for streaming. But the same, at the same time, it's not an in your face, you know, watch all our new shows, etc. It's recognizing that there is a more psychological, emotional need that needs to be addressed before a hard sell is done. Pepsi Cola Products Philippines Incorporated uh, distributed beverages and snacks to officers manning checkpoints across the country, and they have also implemented flexible work arrangements. What's interesting about this is, and this uh, we, we've we've read from a study of McKinsey, is that in an age of in, in the event of a pandemic, uh, you know sometimes the, the big brands are no longer available in the shelves because they're they're the first ones to go. So the interesting insight is that the, the, the challenger brands now have the opportunity to be able to, you know, to let themselves be tried by the customers uh, in the greater uh, market. And we've asked some questions uh, to the customers and they said that actually this is the right time for them to be able to try out new products. And they are actually considering shifting to a challenger brand this pandemic is over because you know some level of trust was able to to emanate from that relationship uh, during this very difficult time. Uh, Metro Pacific Investment Corporation imposed a 30-day payment extension to PLDT Home, PLDT Enterprise, Smart and Sun post paid customers. So I think this kind of uplifting and really understanding what the situation of our customers is uh, it is very important in terms of making sure that at the end of this entire crisis your brand is seen not only as a brand that uh, can relate to the greater majority, but has stayed true to its mission of being in service uh, to, to its customers and the entire ecosystem. So be helpful, be useful and uplifting uh, through uh, empathic communications are the three things that we found to be uh, the, the fundamental rules of engagement uh, during this particular pandemic. We realize that in times of crisis, consumers desire to patronize trusted brands increases mentally 
transporting them back to a simpler time. And this is, I think, something that we all want to be able to feel. You know, uh, I think to a large extent, this pandemic, this COVID-19 is something uh, that feels like a nightmare to, to, to all of us. It doesn't seem real. Uh, and, and a lot of us are just wishing that we can just be transported back in time when it's much simpler, when, you know, we could just go about our lives as normally as can be. So I, I think it's, it's really an opportune time for brands to be able to communicate or engage their customers in such a way that you are able to transport them to that simpler time. So they have a sense of peace and calm that they can uh, muster even during this difficult uh, crisis. As I mentioned, uh, it provides a unique time for, for new or challenger brands to stand out as a result of innovative or compassionate ways that they are trying to gain their share of trust. So if you're a second, third tier, fourth tier brand, don't feel defeated. This is actually the very, very good opportunity for you to be able to, to get your share of trust in the market. So boost your, 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 your communication, your engagement with your customers. Of course, in the tenets that we mentioned about being helpful, useful, uh, and uplifting to be able to introduce your brand to the market that previously uh, did not really recognize you uh, that much. As mentioned, trust can be leveraged on to bounce back and recover faster, uh, and its absence will dictate how long a time you need to regain lost ground if you survive at all. Uh, and this actually makes trust as the most stable currency that institutions must have in huge research to engage its stakeholders. That's it. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I would be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Morty. Um, we we'll talked about challenge, challenge of staying in the minds of clients, being top of the mind or uh, remembering your brand. There were a lot of good points that he mentioned. Trust well define our survival in the present and success in the future. And I will remember that with uh, uh, words that was mentioned, useful, helpful, and uplift. And with the very good examples that were shared to us, I hope that a lot of companies who are watching right now can also think about their programs and services and how they can help whoever their clients are, whoever their customers are at this very time. So think about, you know, whatever you can share in terms of products or maybe in terms of services. That was as what was mentioned by Sir Mori here. It doesn't have to be that big. The most important thing is for you to connect with them so that you can still continue on. Um, establishing the trust that you have uh, started even way back. OK, so for the questions here, we have actually wait. Uh -huh. OK, here's one from Anonymous. Do you think, mm, do you think Ligo handled their communication properly? Their market is the Masa, which are no known supporters of, of uh, the president and now they are facing a backlash. How do you think this will affect their brand? Well, you know, the legal example is very, very interesting. Uh, but in order to assess uh, whether they did the right thing, you have to take a look at the entire context because you're seeing the legal business being run by a new generation of leaders already. And this new generation of leaders also have, you know, a very distinct uh, they have very distinct politics. They have a very distinct uh, level of, of, of personalities and, and, you know, sensibilities, so to speak, very different from the previous generations. I think that the way they handled it, and if you, if you look at it, um, at the onset, they were really trying to create a brand personality of Ligo that is woke or conscious of current events, which is the reason why some of its marketing communications leveraged on you know, making a statement on the on the state of politics, you know, uh, that um, the legal brand did not need, you know, extra powers, for instance, uh, to, to be able to open a can of, of, of good sardines, etc. Of course, it's it's a witty, it's a playful market uh, tactic, um, you know, and, and, and it's a double entendre uh, for, for a lot of people because it could it could mean on one one hand just simply opening a can of legal sardines, but it could also mean, you know, uh, throwing shade to the government for having to ask for for extra powers. So 
there is no there is still black or white there because Ligo was really trying to make it clear that its authentic tonality with its new leaders is a brand that understands and recognizes that it cannot be detached from popular conversation, that it has to make a stand, you know, for, for very important and meaningful conversations that represent and affect its its, uh, its whole customer base. So whether or not uh, Ligo Sardines is appealing to a, to a mass market or a, a middle market has uh, little or nothing to do with what it stands for as a company i think and that's i that's i think that the most important thing that the leaders of ligo wanted to emphasize um and and you can see uh, in the latter uh, marketing communications they've been very adept at accepting that you know they've been in the line of fire uh you know they've been fried and then they were promoting their fried sardines so again it's in keeping with with, you know, uh, latching on to a popular conversation, making sure that the tonality is young, making sure that the tonality is woke and conscious, uh, but at the same time, it does not disrespect, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the politics of other people. Uh, I think what it needs to do moving forward is really to, to disconnect the personality of the owners with the personality of the brand. I think that is the thing that they need to make sure happens in the next few months. Uh-huh. Okay, well said. Sir Mori, this time uh, coming from Anonymous, when do you think clients will start doing on-ground marketing activities, assuming the ECQ is lifted on May 15? I think realistically, clients have realized that it will never be back to business as usual. I think now the more responsible thing to do for brands to think about how to virtualize all of these experience economy you know um, uh, um strategies that we're thinking of what we've been thinking about first. so all the events all the pressers and all of these different uh, you know ex ex experiences will have to be replicated in the virtual world already so this is an opportunity for us to be very creative uh an opportunity for our companies to like really bridge into the digital transformation and make sure that all of these experiences are had and even and even enhanced through all of the different platforms that we have now. Because realistically, I doubt if we will be able to continue doing all of, of our events uh, in the next six to seven months. I, I really feel that if we are going to do any events, it's going to be in the, the second half of 2021 already, just to make sure that you know we don't run into complications. Yeah, actually we have a number of um viewers who come from the tourism industry uh they're mentioning about you know how to become creative or thinking about how to become creative especially so that when we talk about tourism it's actually uh experiential tourism that's selling more you know um but in in this time we're, when we are already talking about virtualized uh experience how will we or how will we apply that well, the first order of the day is really to to inform ourselves with the different innovations already happening in this particular landscape. So augmented reality, virtual reality platforms, and all the different plugs, plugins, I think we have to be able to explore it. Um, our chief technology officers in our businesses or our IT, for instance, or our MIS, they need to be upskilled in terms of, you know, how can we um, replicate traditional experiences uh, onto digital? And there are a lot of companies and brands already doing that. We see that a lot of museums in Europe are actually changing the way that people uh, visit their, their galleries uh, from, the, from the traditional physical sense and now into augmented reality settings. Um, and in fact, it, it's not... Uh, a pale comparison to the way we used to to experience um, um, galleries because now it's an, it's an even and more enriched experience because audio is there you can see a lot of different information on, on the layer of your screen etc so it doesn't take away from the experience if anything if, we're, if we re truly understand what the platform provides it, it provides us an even richer ability to engage our customers so i think the first order of the day is to really make sure 
that we do our research properly. You know, what are the, the, the different technologies that are already available in the market? Secondly, how do we transport our own brand and brand experience by leveraging leveraging those tools. And third is uh, think about you know partnering with creative technologists. These creative technologists could be programmers, could be um, designers who can actually up, uh, update or even innovate on the existing platforms that we have now. Some of uh, the companies um, you know pre prior to this crisis always thought that no i don't need programmers i don't need artists because you know I, I a bulk of my 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 uh, business really comes from high touch um, experiences now it's a time for us to think differently how might we be able to get on that digital platform what kind of uh, skills and what kind of people do i need in my team to be able to export my brand experience onto different platforms like digital yeah, thank you very much. Digital platform is really in, and uh, it's our solution to social distancing too. Okay, question here. All the tenets mentioned, helpful, useful, and uplift. How will we apply for a small, how will it apply for a small business school as a institution, as an institution? Coming from tourism this time, it asks coming from the uh, school as an institution. Well, um, as mentioned, those three tenets don't just apply to companies. Um, however, small your contribution is, your brand just needs to to be able to tap into, um, you know, practically with with your audience. So if you're a school, know that your 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 stakeholders include the students and their parents. You know, so when you create. Uh, engaging communications, whether on social or whatever platform you choose, make sure that you talk directly to the students who are experiencing a, a big lull in, in their educational uh, portfolio, but also talk to the parents who have the additional responsibility of being able to provide the instruction and the, the, the learning for their children while school is not ongoing. So I guess being helpful and being useful is uh, actually giving the ability um, and and uh, and the courage for for these parents to take on that responsibility while the schools aren't ready to do it yet, uh, but also um, uh, make sure that being be, by being useful, you also take into account okay as 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 an institution as a school, how can I be able to bridge some of that need to our customers who are online? So what kind of uh, of of services or what kind of products can I deploy? In the digital front, able to to reassure the parents that I am a brand that gives them the digital tools to be able to give instructions to their kids, or for the kids to maintain that relationship with them. Here are some exciting or creative things that you can do with my brand through Facebook Live, for instance, through through um, YouTube, or through Instagram, and all of these different platforms that are, by the way, free. Um, you just have to continue communicating or engaging your customers, be it the parent or the student, and make sure that that continues uh, until this uh, next normal is achieved. Okay. Um, these are two related questions. It says here, not all MSMEs can go virtual amid this crisis. How can enterprises with no access to internet be innovated to be able to remain in the minds of customers? Are there any practical ways? And um, relatedly, uh, not all MSMEs have the same resources with big companies. How can they be top of the mind as far as their uh, customers or clients are concerned? I, I think that's uh, the, the the most challenging part of it. I mean, because of social distancing and because of the enhanced uh, community quarantine, um, people are not able to go out of their houses. Uh, they're not able to to receive any kind of advertising or marketing in any other platform aside from digital. Um, so your ability to be able to market and talk to your customers becomes very limited. Um, if you're not already online, your only real options would be uh, television, which happens to still be expensive and also radio uh, because you won't be able to do any out of home. Uh, you can still look at print 
but that still is already on the decline and uh, you know um, it's going to be a scattershot approach as well. So I, I, I think now is the time to be able to think about digital transformation. If you feel that your business is not yet online or does not have the tool to build um, its fundamentals online, and then I think it's time to go to the drawing board and plan it with your, your team. How do we get onto that platform? Because the new normal, all else will be left behind. Mm -hmm. And talking about digital transformation, uh, there's a question here that says, in a nutshell or general overview, can you give us suggestions on how we can um, make use of digital transformation to the tourism industry? Um, well, there are a lot of different ways to apply digital transformation in the tourism industry. Um, things first is really to, to identify who among your customers are online, what platforms are they using, uh, and what's the best way to communicate with them on those platforms. I think tourism by and large um, has a very, very big presence on digital. You know, prior to this pandemic, we see a lot of the tourism, the, the tourism business by and large was disrupted already by all of these tech startups. You know, Airbnb, Click, all of these different platforms have already, you know, risen uh, and have occupied top of mind of the customers um, already. It's just that the pandemic put a stop to it. But make no mistake about it, the disruption has already happened. And everyone else who have not taken advantage of of the digital platform will really be left behind, and uh, eating the dust of all those tech startups who have already uh, uh, gathered uh, a lion's share of the market. Uh, so it's also making sure that you have a platform, a robust platform, where your customers can look at all of your deals and services. Think about your customers: are they using laptops, desktops, or mobile? Because the investment in being able to develop a product through the cell phone is different from, you know, the investment that you need to do if the product were to be uh, just a web for a for a laptop or for a, for a tablet. Um, the user experience is very different when you're using a cell phone as opposed to you're using a laptop. So again, those are things that you have to consider. You also have to consider um, payment. You know, how will your customers be able to pay? Uh, um, their, their transactions to the digital platform. Are you a, a business that can only do cash on delivery? Well, that's going to be a problem, especially when majority of the of the customers who, uh, you know, who partake in travel and tourism already use um, digital currencies or or their credit cards or or debit cards. You really have to be able to look at the entire supply chain and make sure that you can deliver on all of those experiences because at the end of the day, the, the, the company that does the end to end seems to be the winners of this kind of, of journey. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think we, before we go to the final question, let me just take this opportunity of inviting everyone. The Department of Trade and Industry is actually launching Reboot Philippines. It's an e-commerce uh, series of seminars or webinars, and it will be covering a lot of topics from uh, providing you with online platforms where you can sell your products and services to e-payments and uh, to e-fulfillment, meaning the logistics and um, ways of delivering these goods and even services to your respective uh, homes. So watch it out, watch this out because it's coming to your home, straight to your home starting Wednesday, that's April 29, and it will run until um, 15. I hope and we hope that it will already be launched and will that be tomorrow? OK, but anyway, watch out because the DTI will be launching Reboot Philippines and a lot of platforms, online platforms, Shopee, Lazada, Google, Paymaya, Gcash, OK, etc. All of them are on board. So we hope that we can share our information to you. OK, finally, this time coming from the hotel industry, to the houses for the, those fly industry accommodation. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The final question is actually coming from the accommodation uh, industry, coming from the hotel industry, and they're just asking, especially the small ones. They're asking, 
how can they manage their future as far as you know marketing and promotion is concerned? Um, yeah, so uh, similar to how I answered the questions a while ago, I think the first step is to be able to look at the free platforms today. So whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, um, you have to be able to check what kind of functionalities can these platforms uh, give uh, a small business or a medium-sized business to be able to, number one, um, show its customers the entire breadth of, of its services. Number two, how how your customers will be able to take advantage of your deals or your different products, how to contact you. Is it going to be an online um, um, uh, ordering system, etc., or do they have to email something? You have to start somewhere. I think the beauty with digital is that, you know, you can make mistakes and make iterations thereafter. It's not like when you make a mistake now, it's the death of your business. No, what 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 digital is able to process to, to, to able to pros, promise its um, stakeholders is that it's a platform that iterates itself every so often. So if this particular modality doesn't work for you, then you can move on to a different tier, etc. Until you realize that you've already amassed some level of, of, of experience and expertise that you can launch your own website, for instance. That's a, a, an end-to-end -end booking uh, facility, etc. But for, for, for the meantime, and uh, all of these different tools are available, whether free or subscription, um, it, it makes sure that depending on where you are in the digital maturity, you, you can you can make sure to to be able to introduce your your brand and services to the market. So now it's really a matter of getting into those platforms and trying out all of the different functionalities that can be beneficial to you as a brand. Just don't be scared. Don't be intimidated by the digital platform. I think the key to be able to unearth all of its promise and, and opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, there are a lot of you know online courses where they can learn all these things. It's just a matter of maybe how they start it, how to be on board, and uh, once they are there, uh, I think the challenge of learning more uh, will start uh, to diminish. Okay, unless you have any questions or insights, additional insights, Mr. Calma. Uh, Maurice said it all. <laughs> He's the expert on trust building. <laughs> they, they did. He, he leads the team that does the Philippine Trust Index for for our for Eon. So you're in good okay. hands there. Okay. Yes. Okay. So once again, we'd like to thank the Chief Innovation Officer of Eon Group, Mr. Mori Rodriguez. We Thank will so also much. be sharing this on uh, yeah, yes, on our uh, website and on our Facebook account. So if you missed anything, this presentation and the explanation behind all those presentations, do catch um, that uh, uploading of this webcast. Okay, you said we move on to our next resource. Yeah, yeah. No, uh we will finish first a little bit of the innovations and then and before we move to Alex, because case study yung ki Alex. Eh. Wait, I'll just share something. Okay, okay wait. Hmm. There you go. So, Mori, thank you again. I'm sure that our attendees are busy thinking about what they can do right now to engage their clients and customers, even in these times of ECQ. Sabi mo nga, silence from the enterprises should not be an option in the, in the ECQ, right? So can you see the, the slides now? Uh -huh. It's still the slide that, thanks Morty. So maybe we'll yeah, have okay, it next okay. time. Thank you, Nano. Yes. So... We talked about uh, the, the last slide that we presented was about taking a new perspective on how business operates. And we talked about studying the markets, taking note of the trends, reviewing operations, and making your downtime productive. And the most, uh, the, the last point I want to make before we leave this slide is do not be afraid to be creative and innovative. Those are actually the two survival kits that work in these times of disruptions. In fact, there's no better time, time than now to let those ideas flow because everyone is back to zero. This is not the time to sit down and just wring our fingers, though I grant that we allow ourselves that sad time. And as you can see, 
Your sentiments are shared by many. McKinsey and Company did a survey among business enterprises across regions and globally, this period is worse and I do not even think we have to validate that. But what the study also revealed is, uh, is that across regions, the most downbeat about the state of their country's economy is actually Asia Pacific. It is what it is. And after taking the time to rant, to cry and shout in frustration, Kalma na tayo and let's start the process of rebuilding if you intend to stay in the game. So makikita nyo dyan sa, sa chart, ano, parang 86 Asia, uh, Asia Pacific says, pinakamalaking black sila that says they are not very optimistic about uh, the future of their country's economies. So... So what I'm uh and the lang, uh, so I lost my, my slides. So the thing is it is a changed world, and I think the sooner that we accept that the better for every one of us. Uh, we have a lot of things. How do we the the, the task on hand now is how do we reactivate our businesses? How do we get back on the groove? And uh, how do we now view our industry in new lens, not only thinking about surviving, but in spotting new opportunities that came out of this crisis and adapting quickly to take advantage of this, even changing our business models if we have to. In these times, there will be others who are likewise competing for the attention of the market. And I mean the global market, because that's where we in the tourism sector operates. And it will be bloody. If you will still, still do the same tired strategies that you think has worked so well. There was no pandemic then, and even in the 9-11 days, it was not back to zero. It is now. That means we do not only do this so we can keep our businesses running but also as part of our crisis management planning strategies to implement actions that will inoculate or vaccinate our enterprises from future recurrences, or at least that even when they do happen, it will only mildly hurt our enterprise. Let's start by changing not only our mindsets, but also our heart sets. Let's shake off those blues and put on our mantle of determination and passion because Ako mismo, I believe that you did not get to where you are today by accident. You have the character in you to build something from the ground up and make it successful. And you can do that again. Just resolve to do it. And there are some things that I will probably uh, uh, ask you to join me in recalling. That for instance, don't conclude that business will be terrible. It will just be different. Kahit na meron tayong mga problema ngayon, uh, there will be opportunities that you will see because that's what we human beings are programmed to do, survive. And that's what these people who are living right now are doing, surviving. So, babalik tayo sa isang daigdig na maring iba, pero hindi naman siya terrible. And there will be other opportunities that will be out there waiting for us to mine. Then second is put statistics in perspective. Uh, okay, so sinabi na down by 30 to 50 percent ang economy. Eh, meron pa rin namang 60 to uh, 30, what do you call this? Naiiwang porsyento that are also full of uh, opportunities. So we view it either as half empty or half full. Third is we study, we consult and learn. Bakit tayo gagawa ng trial and error if we can have expert insights or exchanges with our colleagues? It will help if you are willing to listen. Just don't think that you have the uh, mo a monopoly of good ideas. Sometimes even ideas from across industries, from other industries, they could probably work in our industry too. So it will help if we are willing to listen. You join webinars like this. Uh, maring alam na natin, but we keep on learning every day and there are still new things that we we can learn. Then take risk by innovating. After all, what are you already losing? What more do you have to lose, especially if you are smart about doing this? So, big seven, since we're back, 
back to zero, innovate na, mag, mag, magtingin na tayo. Pero sinasabi ko nga, hindi naman siya trial and error kasi nag-aaral din naman tayo and we're trying to back this up with the uh, experiences also and benchmarking. Then let's streamline our operation because now is the best time to do this. As Mori mentioned, digital transformation is accelerating. We also have gig economy booming. How do we leverage on this? And because shared services is picking up, how do we also make use of all of these uh, new things that are available now in the market that could help us streamline our operation? Then don't be afraid to do things differently. Kahit na sabihin, oh, hindi ginagawa yan dito sa industry. Aba, hindi nakarating si Mark Zuckerberg sa top ng Facebook kung hindi niya inisip to do something differently. Next is be visible. As Maury said, keep yourselves at the forefront of the minds of your customers and clients. You've got to communicate with them. And you can do that not just by writing emails or something, but you could also leverage social me media to make your presence felt. And then build trust, as Maury mentioned, through effective communication. And last but not the least, to dine on self be true. Huwag nang gaya-gaya. No? And also that if you're having difficulties, admit mo because the first thing that uh, will make you solve those problems if you is to admit that you have them. So let magpakatotoo lang tayo. Sabi nga nila, tayo, let's not pretend that everything is rosy when it's not. And let's not also pretend that uh, we're in dire straits when in fact hindi naman. Kumikita pa rin naman tayo. So let's all... Uh, uh, at this time, I think of the crisis, it's time to be really, really be true. And that's the only way that we could build trust with our clients. And we are also should be, uh, we also should be willing to go beyond the usual and above the normal. And one way to spot new opportunities is to creatively address people's fears, uncertainties, and lack of trust. And this time I will wear my, my uh, hat as a psychologist. No? The, the new tourists, will be, will have different set of uh, characteristics, no? The new tourists will be afraid kasi takot tayong lahat dito sa infection eh. And therefore, uh, mahirap lumabas. There's so many, uh, no, it will be, he will, he or she will always be anxious about what it, what, uh, what world they will be, will be encountering out there. So the new tourists will need assurance, no? So, Kailangan niya na makita in all of our actions that once he gets to engage with us, he is safe. The third aspect is that the tourist, even if he sees in your social media, and I'm telling you that you need to, you know, to, to proclaim to the world how you are doing uh, safety and uh, safety mechanisms in your companies, he will still be cautious. Titignan pa rin niya, I, I always say in, in the hospital setting, even if a new hospital is coming up or just open, hindi ka agad papasok ang pasyente. Titignan muna niya kung may lumabas na buhay. Bago niya sasabihin na pwede pala akong pumasok kasi pwede ka palang mabuhay sa hospital na yon. But until then, until that confidence is built, that traveler, that client, that customer will always proceed with cautions. Caution. And finally, the last stage, pag ma-overcome niya tong tatlo, sana may confidence na siya. And that confidence, when it comes back, is our time na to, to, ano, to be, since we have constantly kept in communication with that person and we have tried to address the, the, the things that he's afraid of by assuring him and by uh, hand-holding him during the, during the time na uh, cautious siya, that we will also be that top of his mind when he starts to pick up his travel uh, bag again. So some thoughts. There should be more consciousness and quality every step of the way. So it start, starts with safeguarding your own people, the assurance that supplies are coming from trusted sources, quality check, that they are prepared in hygienic and sanitary way. And I think that all of these are included in our, in our uh, uh, checklist. But the thing is, you also you also show this to your clients. Like for example, mahilig naman tayo mag-post sa Facebook, halimbawa, o sa, pag nag-install ka ng hand sanitizer sa door mo, take time to post it in your Facebook and say, we just installed a new sanitizer in our organization. So all of these things are what we call subliminal advertising. It brags by not bragging. So by posting in here, nakikita yan ng mga clients and say, ay, meron pala sila, they're taking steps 
to address our fears. They're taking steps to safeguard our uh, our hygiene, to protect us from viruses, etc. No? So, nakikita nila lahat ito. So, so, I think it would be good also to plan that and then proclaim that to the world. So, big ideas. Let's talk about big ideas. And I'll first start with shared services. We are talking about uh, cost uh, effectiveness in resuming the operation. But maybe shared services is, the is an idea whose time is coming. Kasi rather than just have your own uh, service na solo nyo lang, and you're going to spend for that, why don't you think about sharing some of the services? What are those services? Well, you can think about sharing, for example, uh, the printing of your marketing collaterals, maybe the packages that you are planning, maybe working with the, with the, the rest of the industry so that you come up with the, uh, san ba natin isosource tong, ano, tong material na to, san ba natin? So at least hindi ka na nag-create nag ng sarili mong service that, ano, that, uh, that shrinks also your uh, your operating cost. Then next is the baby steps for the market, which means you need to do confidence building. So, alam nyo, hindi kaagad na, we, we say that, oh, maybe we should uh, promote uh, domestic tourism. It's not going to happen that, that easily because the next municipality, meron siyang, ano, meron siyang lockdown din, meron siyang constraints also about allowing new people to come in and then possibility of contaminating their, their communities. So, baby steps, when I talk about ba baby steps, we talk about tayo-tayo muna. O di, sabi ko nga doon nung pinag-uusapan namin itong mga steps na to. bakit hindi mo sabihin muna doon sa malapit sa'yo na nakikita ka niya na, alika, punta ka dito, subukan mo na, and especially for those na merong mga destinations, no? Just invite neighboring communities first and then take pictures of them and then nakikita that you have installed uh, safety mechanisms in those destinations. And so people will start to say, oy, may nagpupunta doon pala, o. Oh. So it starts with communities, yung malalapit sa inyo, kasi hindi masyadong matagal ang explanation sa kanila, because they know you already, kapit-bahay ka nila. Then, it, you, you, you uh, expand to province to province, finally region to region. I think in one of our uh, activities nun sa way back nung when we were in DOT, we were thinking about doing this, that there should be regional uh, promotions, intra and inter-regional promotions, because we need to beef up the domestic market. But even it's not going to happen overnight. So, but it's not also going to happen unless we show that we are already in the, in the uh, process of building up our destinations again to to respond to the new requirements of the market so we just have to keep on uh, showing people that we are taking steps to make sure that our destinations are prepared and uh, the third is understanding of health is more multi-dimensional brands and retailers that focus their efforts on these quickly emerging health trends are likely to see consumers respond with increased demand during this epidemic. So we're talking about, in some brands, they talk about hygienic and safe product concepts. Pero tayo, what are the things that we can, you know, we, can I, we can offer to our clients? I think this is the time for health and wellness, for exercise and fitness, for detox. I think so, I, I see some of those people mentioning that maybe forest bathing, uh, mga solitary walks, etc. So these are probably things that we can offer. Pero it has to be properly packaged. Hindi yung uh, magpapakita ka ng tao that umaakyat na ay naglalakad dun sana without saying anything. There has to be a rhyme and reason for that. That means we have to think about this very well. How do we offer health and wellness, especially in these times where people are so conscious about it? And I think this is a package right now that conceived and prepared well is really will really become one of the the best selling uh, packages moving forward we are also going to talk about detoxification uh, breathing fresh air and for this you can position farm and faith tourism and community based tourism and i think those ideas are coming except that we cannot do it in our traditional way, yung mga iniwanan natin bago mag-COVID. We have to think about doing and packaging all of these things differently now, post-COVID. 
Ano ba yung mga attitudes ngayon ng mga consumers, uh, customers and clients about this? What were the things that they considered important during these times? And you can see in their posts. Now, how do we now conceive of a product that responds to this requirement of the market? Now, I think uh, I think in the future, the subject of our webinar should be how do we configure packages so that we're able to sell something on this on these uh, spaces that uh, that will look appealing and will be uh, something that our travelers will consider for the meantime. The other thing is the home body economy or the domestic and community tourism because as I said, uh, I mentioned na mag, mag sell muna tayo sa community but because they also have money to spend right now that medyo uh, especially for those markets na who can afford pero nat natenga sa buy. So they will not want to wander far away. But if we can show that our destinations has the proper uh, environment for them, they might be willing to come in to relieve themselves of the, the idea that they were cooped up in their houses for so long. So what are these, are, are these things that we can offer? There's a market segment for that. And I think we should think about that uh, package right now. The, the other thing is the digital, the, the advent of digital nomads. I think I, I, I'm, I was very interested in this because I know that right now everyone is talking about uh, uh, digital transformation, but there are also people who just wants to be alone and uh, work on their computers. And so one of the things na we need to find in our facilities, in the facilities that we patronize right now is the enablement. No? Paano ba ang ano? Paano ba natin iwawire ngayon ng ating mga facilities so that it enables all of the the transactions, the businesses, and all of the things that digital nomads are are uh, prone to have in their travels. I'm talking about people who travel for for uh, not for leisure but really for business. They stay in places, but they would want the infrastructure by which to do their business in this environment. So. I, I, there are articles that I could share with you about this uh, new uh, segment of the market, and I think we should also consider this as we look at packaging or repackaging our services to appeal to new markets that open up as a result of uh, the pandemic. Next is how are you making your ECQ work to keep you in the minds of your clients? I'd like to, to uh, just give an example of how um, the other properties are trying to find mechanisms by which they will be able to earn even in this ECQ. So they don't, for example, Marriott, ano, I'll just, meron lang Marriott nito, ano, uh, they sell, they sell the, the beddings for, ano, for, for how, for sleeping. It was really for me, it struck me as nice because that is something that's different, ano, instead of sabi nilang punta kayo dito, mag, mag ano, kayo sa hotel, they started to, uh, to, what they call this, show all of these things and say, hey, why don't you just uh, buy our linen and uh, and uh, other sleeping uh, materials from the hotels? Anyway, marami nga sa mga Filipinos ang mahilig mag-uwi mag nito. Eh. So the, I'm, I showed this just as an example of how innovation and creativity is finding or warming its way into some of the business models so that they are finding spaces that prior to this we have not even considered. Urge government meetings to be coursed through the travel groups. Oh, madali natin i-suggest ka agad dito sa government. Na if you're going to meet, siguro dapat kayo ang mauna to ano to patronize the travel groups, no? Course your business government meetings through us. And then exchange travels and promotions. So why don't we uh, uh, touch base with our counterparts in the provinces, in other communities, and say, oh, why don't we, you uh, know, why do, why don't we exchange travel so that we are able to boost confidence of our clients in uh, in starting to find their fit again in the travel market? And of course, I mentioned something also about community caravans. And uh, finally, I want to talk about that segment that depends on, on tourism also, the tour guides, they mostly belong to the gig economy and therefore mainly, maybe many of them are not even registered as professionals. For now, they might be asking dollar for assistance or even DSWD. But what if the group of travel, uh, travel operators or 
many of us in the tourism industry adopt a consortium approach so that we are also able to take care of our uh, partners by providing safety nets, social support, and uh, uh, universal income. So I just, uh, these are the things that uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies like uh, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Sanofi, they're working together to find a solution by coming up with vaccines. Ibig sabihin, uh, magkaapat apat silang companies, magkakaiba sila ng, ano, ng management, by but they decided to pull their resources so that together they can find a solution for something. And I think in many of the things that we're talking about, like shared services, gig economy, consortium approach, and all of these, we have to find ways now to work together because I think the situation in the new world will call for that kind of uh, approach. So for this, let us uh, find out what uh, what uh, uh, people like uh, this young uh, tourism officer from Naga, how they are doing in that province and how they are crafting their business recovery so that veterano sila ng mga, ano, ng mga disasters. But how are they doing right now and how are they mapping their business recovery? recovery plan. So I'll turn this over now to you, Alec. Hi, you, sir. Hi, hi everyone. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay, po ba? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, I hope that uh, you're still with us. Uh, sana nakapagkape na kayo. Uh, I've had my coffee while you uh, <laughs> check Almo was uh, continuing with her presentation. Uh, so, uh, okay, I I'll get down to it. Um, I'd like to share, uh, I'll share my screen so that um, kita nyo po yung natin presentation. Right. So, basically the name of the game is uh, Disruption. Uh, so we're talking about uh, disruption. I would like to think of it as uh, harnessing disruption. Um, this is uh, Vicos Tourism Renewal Plan. So take note, we didn't use the word recovery uh, for a reason, for a good reason. And uh, you'll know that later on. So when we say, uh, when we say, um, well, reality check muna tayo. Uh, sabi nga kanina ni Yusek, uh, tourism talaga, as we know, will change. Uh, it's quite different. Uh, when we go out of this uh, ECQ and when we come out of this uh, this uh, crisis, global crisis, tourism will have changed. Um, just today, I read an article from uh, of quoting Bill Gates, and he refers to this current crisis as pandemic one. So similar to how we used to refer to the great wars, global wars, as World War One and World War Two, uh, he's calling it uh, pandemic one. Uh, sabi niya, we should look at this as another world war, but this time around, we are all on the same side. So, ibig sabihin, uh, he is emphasizing the need for us to really be cooperative. So, for tourism, uh, that's the reality. And the inevitability of disruption. You have to remember that disruption has been knocking at the tourism and travel industry store for some time now. So, as uh, Sir Mori has uh, mentioned earlier, yung Airbnb, Grab, Uber, here in the Philippines, online travel agencies, DIY tours, uh, they have been knowing at our revenues especially yung mga, mga formal natin ng mga travel and tour agencies and organized um, establishments. Um, we have been putting off um, action, really, to decisive action to address them. So, kumbaga, um, they, they were already there uh, before the pandemic, before all of this. So, it was only a matter of time before something big, uh, uh, before something big came along to change the game. So, in our case, uh, it's this pandemic. So, of course, again, changing disruption requires us to change the rules of the game. So, this is what it is. It's a game-changing disruption. Tama yung sabi ni Yusek kanina, tama yung sabi ni na, uh, Mori, that uh, everything has changed. Uh, this is no longer, there is no going back to business as usual. From this point on, it's always business unusual. It's no longer business as usual. There are changing travel behaviors. First, people will say, uh, I'm afraid to travel. Next, people will say, I'm all, I'll only travel if I really need to. Then they'll say, okay, I'll travel closer to home. And then finally, when there is a vaccine or a cure in the horizon or when everything is uh, basically under control, 
then that then the time that they said they have the confidence that to say that I'm ready to travel anywhere. So right now we are at this first stage. I'm afraid to travel. So this is what people think about travel or what they're thinking about travel right now. First is safety. This is the big part. And then next is safety, but in orange. And then another one is safety, but also in blue. But now in blue. So uh, it's all about safety. Uh, yeah, that's the pervading thought in everyone's mind. Uh, travel is the last thing on people's mind right now, especially when you turn on the news and you know and you 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 hear that okay, this particular country or this particular province in the Philippines is seeing an increase, or a certain community has been on lockdown because of uh, uh, the increase of uh, cases. So, nakakatakot yung news when you hear about it. So, it's no wonder that our tourism and travel industry uh, is the one most affected. So what will people think about travel again when the time comes that um, we can travel again? All of it. Just one question. Is it safe? Is it safe? So that's the first thing that we should be able to answer. Is it safe? The new normal will look like this. You have the same. You have the demand side and the supply side. But again, it will always be enclosed in a cocoon of safety. So safety first, safety always. So in everything that you do as tourists when you travel, in everything that we do as service providers or uh, on the supply side, safety will always be the first question. Safety will always be the, the last question and the, uh, basically the subconscious uh, which guides everything that we do. So. How do you master tourism's new normal? First, you think ahead. And then, you think out of the box. So I think that's why we're all here. We're here to learn uh, new ways to innovate. How do we, um, how do we disrupt disruption, basically? Because uh, that's what innovation is. When given a set of circumstances that no one is ready for, and mind you, the last pandemic that we had was about a century ago, and back then, uh, the war had just ended. Uh, the Great War, the First World War had just ended. So tourism wasn't, uh, global tourism or international travel wasn't even existing back then. So right now, we're faced with the same dilemma. And it's surprising that, uh, you know, people back then, uh, governments back then were advising people, okay, wear masks when you go out. A century later, it's still the same. We're, 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 we're basically having uh, the same problem a century ago. So the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, has identified key areas for any effort of any tourism industry in any country. First, it would be to manage the crisis and to mitigate the impact. So again, health, uh, people's safety, your employee safety, your guest safety. And then it would be providing stimulus and accelerating recovery. This is where the government, government support and government presence should be felt. And of course, Looking forward, it would be to prepare for the future. So what about Beacon? Uh, given what uh, the UNWTO's recommendation were, we, the tourism officers of Beacon, uh, especially the provincial tourism officers and I, uh, discussed among ourselves, uh, how can we um, try to forecast what will happen to our regional tourism industry uh, going forward from the ECQ or uh, when, the, uh, when the government Relaxed travel restriction. So we we basically divided it uh, divided post COVID uh, period into four phases. Phase one would be by next month or a month after uh, the relaxation of the ECQ up to August. Then phase two would be around September to February of next year. And then phase three would be March to November of next year. And then finally, phase four would be December 2021 onwards. That would be 18 months. Uh, allow me to delve into the details. Uh, first, phase one. Phase one would be around zero to three months after the listing of the ECQ, which means uh, people will relatively have um, more mobility, at least locally. That would be between June and August of this year. Phase two would be four to nine months after the listing. That would be this coming September and uh, fourth quarter of this year, leading into the middle of uh, the first quarter next year, 2021. Phase three, again, that would be about a year or a year and a half to a year and a half 
uh, after uh, the listing of the ECQ uh, this uh, month, uh, sorry, this coming month or in June, and that would be either March, that would be between March to November 2021, and finally, December 21 onward, hopefully that would be 18 months or 19 months afterward, uh, after all of this, hopefully there will be a vaccine uh, that is uh, assuming that there are already measures in place to ensure the general safety and health of the public. So phase one, basically what we try to see, what we try to set is uh, objective. Our objective on the part of the industry, on the part of the government, and of course a cost-cutting team for everyone involved. Uh, for instance, during phase one, that would be from June to August of this year, what would be the industry objective? First would be to retain resources. So we've, I've heard the, the word retain uh, being uh, thrown uh, earlier during the discussions. And then, of course, uh, you have uh, survival of businesses as an objective of the government for these first three months. And then the cost-cutting theme, because we will be coming out of the gate fresh from the ECQ, fresh from the GCQ, would be safety. So we we'll go back again to safety. So that would be the industry objective to retain for the government objective. Uh, government's objective is for businesses to survive. And then the overall the cost cutting team would be safety. So going to the details. For phase one, we are forecasting that health standards will be imposed and monitored. Uh, if not on a national or a regional, at least on a local level. Travel will most likely be limited to the vehicle region. Of course, even within the vehicle region, it will be heavily regulated since we have more province, there are some provinces which have more cases and are still approaching the peak. Uh, of the firm and strictly for official or essential purposes only. That's the reality. What would be the focus of tourism businesses in Bicol? That would be to retain their resources, their cash flow, their liquidity, their capacity to retain employees. That would be the primary focus. And the government needs to prioritize subsidies for qualified businesses. Right now, the DOF through the SSS that's uh, already uh, rolled out the small business wage subsidy uh, program. And then uh, there are also possibilities for subsidies for rent and utility. Uh, again, uh, I think that there is already a uh, pending bill in Congress uh, for this, for a support fund for the tourism sector. And of course, for freelance tourism workers, uh, you have the dollars to pad where uh, free freelance workers like tour guides like both men working in rural areas who are displaced right now uh, can actually avail of uh, subsidized wages uh, in return for uh, for rendering uh, rendering labor to government uh, agencies for a specific programs. And then there are also LGU programs. You have to remember uh, most LGUs have their peso offices. These are public employment service of uh, services uh, offices. So basically, they they have a uh, fixed funds, but the LGU can access them to augment the, their funds so that they can have additional uh, money or resources to give out uh, to support freelance workers. How about the second phase? This is around September to February of 2021. The industry objective there would be to rethink their business. Again, this is the new normal. You have to rethink your business or otherwise you'll have to shut it down. For the government, that is to stabilize the industry. And the cross-cutting theme would be localization. So this is very important because travel, especially international travel, is not going to return to the same level uh, for the next three years, two to three years. So again, the only hope that we have as tourism uh, businesses, as destinations, would be for localization. When you say localization, uh, as Yusek Alma said earlier, you start off with small communities. You start off within your own LGU, within your own municipality, helping encourage people to move around, to explore what they have there. And then they themselves, when they gain the confidence, then we, they, they, they'll be able to serve as ambassadors. And then later on, when uh, when things are even more in, under control, then you can actually encourage uh, people to basically uh, share um, what they experience within their own area so other people from other towns and other provinces within the region can start traveling. So what would be the details? 
many interregional travel will be by government employees and officials. Government organized events such as seminars and trainings will be crucial sources of revenue for accommodations and my facilities. This means that there is an opportunity here for travel groups, for travel and tour agencies to organize, to facilitate um, this particular event for preparing the logistics or coordinating logistics or coordinating with their accommodations and my facilities. So the government can be encouraged uh, to do this so that at least the resources, the money that the government has goes into the hands of micro and small and medium tourism enterprises so that they can continue operating, albeit on a limited scale, at least they'll have the cash that they need. So the focus here for tourism businesses is to rethink. You have to restructure your business model. You have to retrain and retool employees. For instance, uh, restaurants are suffering because um, basically before they were relying mostly for dine-in, uh, dine-in uh, clients for their revenue. But nowadays, um, they're getting a very, very insignificant portion of their income uh, is retained and they're getting it only from takeout and delivery. So you have to look uh, at, the, uh, at the dilemma because they prepared their physical facilities, their dining room, uh, and bought all of these things uh, because they, they are not just offering food, they're offering the complete experience, the dining experience. So the, uh, the reality is uh, many of those serving in the dining halls, uh, servers, uh, they might be displaced. But there, is a, uh, there will be a strong demand, for instance, for housekeeping. Uh, why? Because when hotels start operating again, or at least when other businesses start operating again, there will be a demand, an increase in demand for housekeeping services. Why? Because people will be afraid. Uh, people will be looking for assurance that uh, the, the hotels that they're visiting, that the offices or the businesses that they're visiting uh, are well managed in terms of uh, medical standards, that uh, sanitation is being done, that uh, decontamination or disinfection is being done regularly. So there is an opportunity to retrain or to retool employees. So if the businesses are no longer able to retain them, then at least the LGU or the government can step in uh, to basically retrain and retool these employees and maybe help them find new jobs in other businesses. So the DOT and uh, the LGUs must encourage and facilitate applications for top loans. Uh, I, I know some of you are uh, familiar with uh, the land bank and the DBT um, respective programs uh, to deal with uh, this uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You have the iRescue, you have the Response, you have the DTI Small Business Corporation, C3 ERF. Uh, I'm sure and I hope that the national government uh, will increase the, their funding uh, or increase, uh, give them uh, this, a better leeway or relax the documentation uh, requirements, documentary requirements, so that more micro and small medium enterprises can avail of this. And uh, this is one thing that's more important. The LGUs must come in and then facilitate those. For instance, uh, here in Naga, uh, before the, before uh, several weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we heard about the DBT's response, we reached out to the local DBT and then asked them about the response uh, program and asked them, are you willing to offer that to micro, small, and medium enterprises? And to their credit, not even two days later, they gave, they presented us or they gave us an offer sheet so that we can offer it to micro, small, and medium enterprises. So of course, our priority would be tourism enterprises, and these are soft loans. But again, uh, these are collateralized. So, but uh, we are trying to look at other ways. For instance, if, for instance, there are micro enterprises which may not qualify or may not have the collateral. Uh, to uh, basically a bargaining chip that they can use with the DBT or land bank, then maybe the LGU can take on the soft loan, can take on the loan from land bank and DBT, and then have its own version, a localized version. It's um, think of it as a conditional business credit, but for micro, small, and uh, micro and small enterprises. But of course, um, you have to inject uh, a bit of uh, ingenuity here, and then you can look at the model of uh, Japan. Uh, last February, I went to Japan to study for three weeks on their sixth sector industrialization. So they were able to uh, provide or to inject uh, capital, uh, capital infusion basically into their agriculture of uh, agri agriculture sector 
and but by basically requiring the farmers and the farmers cooperatives and small companies to provide them a business plan which shows that they will be uh, reaching a target of 5% uh, re revenue growth uh, after five years. And then uh, the government, as a condition, told them that, okay, you have to partner or you have to link up with other beneficiaries. So that basically creates a, an ecosystem, so, uh, if you will, uh, a circular economy, localized circular economy. I'll show later what uh, it means when you talk of localization. Phase three, that would be about a year from now, a year from May or June. The objective would be to rebrand businesses. By this time, the businesses should have rethought their business model. They should be rebranding in anticipation of, of uh, further opening or relaxation of travel restrictions. Government here should support businesses. And the cross-cutting theme here would be hopefully domestic travel. By this time, a year from now, uh, people will be uh, more ingrained to travel within the Philippines and uh, forego their travel plans for outside of the Philippines. But again, uh, there, a word of caution, we can go back to the, the, the way that we did tourism before, where people crowded, people would uh, post pictures on Facebook and then people would crowd there. No, no, no. People will no longer head to crowded, uh, crowded uh, tourist attractions and destinations. They'll be looking to lesser known, to safer destinations or uh, they'll be looking for uh, safer attractions and safer activities, so away from the maddening crowd. So there's an opportunity here for lesser known attractions. So if I were you, uh, if I were the travel and tour agency, I'd go looking for them. So majority of domestic travel will be for personal and leisure purposes. This is our, uh, our basically our projection. Tourists will prefer less popular destinations and demand exclusive use of facilities. Uh, it will no longer be a sardine can of a poster or a van for domestic travelers. Uh, it will no longer be a sit-in coach uh, concept or uh, setup. Uh, it will be one van would be used for a by, by a single group. So they will demand exclusive use. Even uh, for the services of a guide, it will be exclusively for them. So there will be no mixing of tour groups. Uh, that will be the norm. The focus here for tourism businesses is to rebrand. Okay. You have to diversify your market. You have to diversify your product. There needs to be uh, a shift to digital transformation. You have to shorten your supply chain, and you have to lower in the uh, lower. Uh, you need to have lower impact travel. When I say shorter supply chain, what I'm saying is instead of importing guides from the other province or from the regional center, then you should be able to get guides locally. Why? Because it's safer. Because you know for a fact that that guide has, has never or rarely leaves that locality. So they have a lesser chance of being infected. They have a lesser chance of uh, transmitting uh, or of being a carrier. So it makes it makes uh, public health sense. It makes medical sense to do that. Uh, and of course, DOT and LGUs must match tourism products. This is where marketing comes from. With the right domestic market and lead the drive towards sustainable tourism. So here we see the word, we see the term, we see the principle of sustainable tourism. For phase four, that would be 18 months, beyond 18 months. That would be December 2021 onwards, or maybe even uh, January or the first quarter of 2022. Industry objective would be to renew the industry, to sustain recovery, that would be the government objective. And the cross-cutting thing would be, by this time, hopefully, uh, if you play our cards right, sustainable tourism. Let me show you the difference later on. International tourists may regain confidence to travel to the Philippines by this time, depending on global economic conditions. Of course, you need to have money to travel. Focus for tourism businesses is to renew quality over quantity, lower impact travel, shorter supply chains, as I have mentioned earlier, and a circular economy. And of course, by this time, the DOT and LGUs should be enabling. So we should be supporting destinations and tourism businesses who adhere to the principle of safe and sustainable tourism. So again, as a recap, these are our projections, sorry. Yeah, so we, to make it easier, we decided to have uh, the different objectives uh, that there are for uh, industry objectives and for government objectives, that would be S. So for industry objectives, it would be in order of, uh, uh, well, in chronological uh, order, 
to retain resources, to rethink business, to rebrand businesses, and to renew the industry. For government objectives, this is what our objective should be for the tourism industry, to make sure that there is a sur the survival of businesses are ensured, to stabilize the industry, to support businesses at the same while they're rebranding, and to sustain this recovery. The cross-cutting things would be safety, localization, domestic travel, and eventually sustainable tourism. So, recap, you have to survive, you have to adapt, and you have to overcome. Quickly adopt survival mechanisms. Make use, full use of government subsidies, employee protection policies, and access support and focus on low-hanging fruit. So this is the, the adopt portion. Soft loans from government financial institutions shift to regional and domestic travel. And then future-proof the industry. This is where digital proficiency and then, of course, product and market diversification comes in. How do you harness disruption? First, safety. Health is wealth. What do you need? Medical standards. Mandatory housekeeping. Whether or not your guest says that you want our rooms to be made, do it. Hand sanitation stations or a mandate, make it mandatory upon entry, upon entering any, any particular common area. Health screening, uh, also, you have to make sure that uh, masks are worn at all times, especially within the company of other people. Health screenings, compulsory symptoms check, uh, rapid test if it becomes more available or even less costly. Uh, you, can, you can also include workplace safety, so you have to be very liberal for your employees when, when, uh, when they, they call in sick. Uh, PPE is for them, and of course, regular disinfection. Next, survive and thrive. You need to focus on cash flow management. You have to restructure your business if you want to, if you need to. You have to rely on government subsidies and, of course, competition or consolidation. Uh, Yusek Alma was saying earlier that uh, what you need to do is basically uh, you have to form consortiums. For instance, if uh, you don't have enough of a uh, volume to rely uh, when the time comes that you're ready to open for business, then you might want to uh, share resources or consolidate your business with uh, those of similar in the locality, similar business in the in the locality, especially for travel and tour agencies. Uh, you can even restructure your business in terms of uh, scaling down. For instance, if you're a travel agency and you use, you have, you're maintaining an office, maybe you'd like to go back to being, uh, or maybe you'd like to scale down to an online travel agency. So you're still accredited, but uh, under the progressive accreditation uh, system of the DOT, uh, you don't have to maintain a uh, physical office. You can remain at home. So that will uh, be a weight, uh, a, a huge weight off a uh, load uh, of your chest. So less is more when it comes to harnessing disruption. You have to rethink your business model. We cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, the old model uh, needs to be rethought. Rebrand your business and you have to diversify. Case in point, exclusive tours, expanded room services, and complete staycation offerings. When, you, when we say expanded room services, we're talking about anything and everything. Uh, instead of uh, the guests going out of the hotels themselves to buy the things that they need, or if they need to run any errands, uh, then maybe you can extend your room services to do it for them. So that way, they still be contained in uh, the hotel. So for hoteliers, you have to remember, the, the more time they spend with you, uh, the better it is for you because the more they spend. So you have to factor this in into your costing. Complete staycation offerings. For instance, you have a tie-up with a local spa. So instead of, you can offer, just instead of just offering a room, you can also offer um, wellness and relaxation packages. It can be part of uh, what they're paying for. And of course, tie-up or dry-up. What do I mean by this? Shorter supply chain. Hire local tour guides and retrain public transport providers. Uh, the LGU, like uh, in our case, the city government has done this, uh, has done this before. Before there was uh, this pandemic, before the ECQ, uh, we were able to train about 60 uh, tricycle drivers so that they could be tourist tricycle drivers. Unfortunately, they haven't had a chance because uh, of this uh, lockdown. But what we did was we referred them uh, to delivery services. And uh, even under lockdown, they're still earning. So we can, you, you can basically retrain public transport providers to become tour guides. Cross-industry links. Uh, local restaurants 
can provide room service din. For instance, they can provide training for the kitchen staff of a small hotel so that they know how to prepare or at least uh, make the uh, make sure that the presentation of meals being delivered to the guests staying in your rooms look much pretty much the same as uh, it as it, it would be served in the restaurant. And of course, you can also implement a regional referral system. So basically, uh, businesses would be referring guests to one another, and then destinations would be referring uh, travelers to one another, and uh, the cost they would have uh, commissions from those. So in the box thinking, we teach you this: that before, uh, this would be uh, the recovery model. We were here before, and then uh, right now we're at the lowest, and then tomorrow it will be all better. Uh, that is if you are counting tourists. But this is no longer the case. We have to think out of the box. So this is, I think, what uh, we think, what, what we should be thinking of. It's still the same curve, but you no longer count tourists. You rely more on revenue. So by the time you recover fully, a couple of years, two years from now, three years from now, uh, our tourists will have uh, fewer, uh, will be lesser than uh, before, but the revenue that they bring in will be the same. So this means that um, you have less tourists, less impact, but the revenue would be the same or even uh, even more. That is, uh, if you're able to achieve the principle of sustainable tourism. Again, when you talk of sustainable tourism, you need adaptive reuse of whatever facilities or resources that you have. You can rely more on local transport. So you no longer have to import or bring in your vehicles or bring in uh, of, uh, bring in service providers from far away. Uh, you can rely on locally available transportation. You can have shorter supply chain. And finally, the carrying capacity. Again, people will be afraid to go to destinations which are crowded. So people would prefer to go to attractions and destinations which uh, are safer for them in terms of density of people, of other visitors. So here, uh, you see the value of having uh, of following the, the right carrying capacity. So in re, uh, to end this, uh, this is the way to the future, the way we see it here in Beacon. Cheap travel is out, but uh, sustainable tourism is in. So this is the opportunity for us uh, to basically uh, rethink not only our businesses, but the industry as a whole. So this is, this is not just the job of the private sector, but also of the government, especially the destination planners, and the destination managers. We should be able to see the opportunity presented before us. That, you know, before we had taken tourism for granted, uh, I even saw in one of the FAQs that there was there were people offering 2,500 pesos and you can be an online travel agency. That was exactly the problem before because uh, we were focused more on quantity. So right now we have to focus more on quality. So uh, we have to change the rules of the game. We have to change the way we measure success. So for us to do that, then we have to embrace the reality, the new normal, the new reality that this, from this point on, there can only be one way forward. It would be through sustainable tourism. So uh, that's it for my presentation. Yes, uh, Teka, I'm, ju I'm just, uh, no. Okay. Okay, thank you. Can you see me now? Thank you, you very much. Uh, um, we, we do not have a lot of questions. Actually, we don't have questions to the presentation, to your presentation. Yeah. Uh, can you see the, can you see yeah, the slides now? Oh, yes. Have, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, ako, Alec, I, I really love the presentation because uh, it also no, it also captured the idea of this being a yes, collaborative sir. thing. Uh, hello? Teka ha, teka, teka. Uh, I think it's still loading. Ah, wala pa siya. Still loading? Go ahead. It's just slow loading. Okay. Alec, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I think it showed a lot of you know, thought of thought leadership in the way you're approaching the, 
the uh, situation and it's nice that uh, a lot of the ideas that you have and that I had presented were really dovetailing because that's actually the most logical and sensible way to view the the different activities post uh, COVID. Teka, nasa na ba tayo, Nelly? Can you see me now? Can you see the slides now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ah, okay. So I, as I was remarking, to, that you did the, you did a very wonderful job. To, huh? I thought you said nandyan na. Is it there already? Yes, ma'am. Yes, po. Yeah, okay. So, uh, ano, ano, Nelly? You cannot see? So anyway, uh, it captured it captured most of the things that we are uh, talking about, and I it's can really good. See it. I cannot see it. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. You say. It's really very good that you're able to 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 uh, reduce that into that plan that could be shared by uh, by other, the other provinces, and uh, it's good that you are taking the lead in uh, doing this. And some of the things that uh, that uh, we need to remember, as I said, that most of the assistance requires that MSMEs are compliant with the law. But because moving forward, you have to pay more attention to compliance issues and that tourism destinations were given breathing space. That means uh, you have to avoid over tourism and instead in the future you really go all out for sustainable tourism development. So today's uh, CEOs are exemplifying the ethos of their 1940s counterparts. Imagine that. To transform their business into a winning firm of the future, they are sharing three main messages with their people. Talk with the most important customers now. Avoid a bounce back to old ways of working and let the company's values and principles guide all of your decisions. And I think I will have to, to emphasize at this point that collaboration will be a key to unlocking a whole new world of potential. I think if anything, we're now aware that uh, no man is an island. And the sooner that we realize that, then the sooner that we get down to the business of working with others and cooperating with others. I think several times in most of the talks that I've given in the past, I emphasize the need for collaboration and cooperation. Why do you want to solo? When, when grouped together, you will actually be, become a bigger force and you will have less painful decisions and less painful transitions to make if you have the power of numbers. And with you being numerous in all of your group together, you could actually compete against the big and the better. So I think in the future, we have to think about this and we have to think of ways by which we could make this happen, not just as a presentation in webinars and seminars, but really going down to the level of ironing out what needs, what steps to be done uh, should be taken in order to make sure that we formalize the initiative to collaborate and cooperate. Such a small speck of bug, yet when it jumped, it shook the big world. As the number of cases climbed at almost the speed of light, so has the walls that everyone thought was strong enough to prop the global structures up. They all came tumbling down. It's a chaos that disrupted the world order. And as every country grappled with the disruption and destruction that the pandemic wrought, the vulnerabilities were exposed. How the uncertainties and fear dominated and overall showed the lack of preparedness to manage a crisis of this scale and magnitude. The world has become too complacent and even lazy. It took for granted the strength of the systems that make for a global order and the benefits it provided as givens. When torture tested by the pandemic, the cracks of the globalization showed and the increasing degree of product specialization, which were supposed to be models of efficiency, became ineffective in scaling up manufacturing of goods badly needed in quantities at a fast rate. So we're all in this together. The threat also revealed how largely uncoordinated the global response system is, putting the world in a virtual standstill. 
It highlighted in a most dramatic fashion the need for governments to share expertise and cooperation to enable an informed evidence-based coordinated response system, one that could spell the difference between survival and perhaps extinction. So how do we rebuild in this change dynamics? I think the takeaway for all of the things that we are discussing is that the pandemic, the balance of power, will shift to people who will now be aware of the power of their collective voices in influencing their outcomes with social media and technology providing them with a strong platform. More importantly, it will also be time to say that tomorrow belongs to those who prepare today. This was uh, a quotation I shared uh, in day one but I'd like to repeat because it's really very, very true. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for today, but don't tell people tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Prepare today and then, te and then tell them the story tomorrow of how you did it. So my last statement for this is that never waste a crisis. It can be turned into a joyful transformation, and I got that from Ram Israel Emmanuel. So thank you very much, people, for uh, staying with us from day one to day three, and I hope you learned a lot in this webinar series, our own small way of helping out uh, in the recovery process as we go through this COVID pandemic. Nelly? Yeah. Um... Okay, thank you very much, Yusek. Um, I like that. Never waste a crisis. It's actually something that you can learn from. It's actually pushing you to do something and making use of whatever resources or innovation that you have around you. Mm -hmm. um, there are just two, some, two things that were raised here. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, it was saying from the plans being presented, Sabinia, this is actually referring to the presentation of Alec. Are you mm -hmm. not considering the second wave of this crisis? According to experts, second wave is likely to happen toward the towards the fourth quarter of this year. But I think we focus the the, the, the month or yes, the year that are presented by Alec or this SME. But I think we should focus more on the process, the suggested um, you know, steps uh, on how we can record it. And uh, good thing there's another um okay that's mentioned here it says Bickle's presentation was very good and i think applicable even to non-tourism enterprises i think we could adapt the template to our small creative consultancy group thank you very much now for the three-day webinar and i love the approach that the lgu made on faces on the faces of the renewal plan very very clear direction that the other LGs can definitely benchmark uh, on. Okay, don't worry for those of you who are asking for copies of the presentation. We got them. Uh, we can share. We'll be emailing the, them to you for as long as you were able to finish uh, even the CSF. And of course, if you want to catch the thoughts and the insights that were shared by our resource persons, uh, not only the slides, uh, catch also our uh, uploading of the, the, the live coverage, this webcast in our um, website, pttc.gmea, uh, and of course, uh, our Facebook account. Well, Yusek, I think um, we really had a very good discussion from day one till day three. We just thank uh, everyone, Nelly, 1, Nelly. 1,000 of them. Yes, Yusek? Yes, no, I would just like to address your sinabunya about the timelines. And all. So if there's one thing that okay. the crisis, the pandemic is teaching us, and I'd leave this as a last message also, it's knowing how to, uh, it's being able to adapt. It's the reason why when you say, kahit na may second wave pa siya or saan, the plans that we're making today will apply when the assumptions that we made using those, uh, when the assumptions that we use in making those plans happen. So, ang ibig sabihin, ang natutunan natin sa crisis na to is always to be fluid, to adapt, and then to, uh, no, to, to move on when it happens. So when, when it doesn't matter ko ano yung timeline, it matters ko ano yung assumption that's, well, that yes. was made to ano, to do that timeline. So I think that's that, that's just the, la, the last comment that I need to make. And again, as I said, I, I really want to thank the PTTC team for uh, supporting this uh, initiative. 
it's really going to be a very helpful uh, tool for, for those who cared to listen, and I hope that they really uh, were able to get something, get key takeaways from this uh, webinar. Thank you, Nelly and the PDTC team. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Yusek. And uh, just to go through what we covered during the last three days, six hours of them, and a lot of you are actually wanting to have a copy of your certificates. I think it's worth it. But just to go over, we had a situation here on health and finance, my finance perspectives on the first day. And then we had the conditional freedom where you were presented certain tax breaks or certain you know, tax measures that, that we hope that the policymakers of the government can adopt. And it was also clearly uh, shared to each and everyone. When we go back to our respective posts, offices or plants or companies, there were also certain guidelines that we can uh, uh, be guided upon. And finally for today, it's actually learning to live again. That's very cute from you, Sek Alma. And we talked <laughs> about marketing, how Yes, how you can stay in the mind of your consumers even at this time. So again, um, there were very useful insights like usefulness, being helpful, and uh, being passionate as uh, among those that were emphasized by our speaker early on. And finally, the experiences um, shared by Alec, who comes from Bicol, as mentioned by Yusek Alma also early on. Um, Bicol is actually one one area that is frequented by typhoons and a number of disasters, natural disasters at that. And yet they were able to stand up and uh, bring back and again, uh, invite or encourage a lot of um, tourists from all over the country and even from all over the world. It's actually one of the top destinations of the Philippines uh, even then. So thank you very much, Yusek, our courtesies uh, from uh, our executive director, Nestor Palabian. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Yusek Alma, for sharing your time and of course for you know facilitating and um, helping us bring in top-notch resource persons who can help us um, make our MSMEs understand more what you know what they can do, how they can contribute, and how they can be guided. Okay, so hats off, Yusek Alma. Okay, maybe now hear from our team if we have already the poll results. Um, Arnold and Roland, do we have the poll results? You know, the poll, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, an information that we're also making use of as our basis or a background or information on what topics or what contents we'd like to share uh, to our um, clients or customers through this webinar. So for the question that we raised early on for our poll, did you encounter challenges in developing BCP and disaster crisis preparedness plan? Okay, for those who said yes, it's only 16%. Uh, no, rather, but for those who said yes, lab awareness on the importance of developing BCP and disaster crisis preparedness plan, uh, it's about uh, 41%. And um, okay, yes, lack of knowledge on how to develop these plans is 56% and lack of management support. I think they have management support because it's only 6% or a company does not have the capacity to de develop. They have and the company can do it. But I think it's the knowledge on how to develop these plans, which is challenging a lot of our MSMEs to do that. So that actually gives us uh, you know, a, an information on what to do next maybe to become relevant and to be responsive to what you need. Uh, this is one thing that we will run in the coming days, something about how to develop the plans for the business continuity. Right, Yusek? Yes, yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much, Arnold. And uh, yes, thank you very much, Arnold and Roland for sharing that. And uh, that's actually our fall result. And and uh, even before we close, we we're asking us about the client satisfaction feedback. But I think it will be part of what we will be requesting from you because, again, we wanted to improve and we hope that you can also add additional information or content that you'd like um, us to cover. Actually, we also got inputs from CGFED, from GADIA, from the Tour Guides Association of the Philippines, if we can consider 
uh, livelihood training for the tour guides. And we also got inputs from Bayan Academy, from BPI. We are really very thankful of your interest to be a part of uh, uh, the webinars that we're running. We hope that uh, we can be partners in time so that we can also include in the webinars of PTTC contents that you also wanted to share. Even Amor, Amor Maklang, thank you very much, of Geyser Maklang for letting us know that you're interested to be a part of the PTTC webinar. So once again, for all the information, the presentation and the live coverage of this webcast, you can catch it at our FB page, okay, PTTC.gmea, and also uh, PTTC.gov.ph is our website, and if there are other information that you'd like to um, uh, learn or get from PTTC, this is our email address. So once again, um, we'd like to thank, thank you all for joining us today. In behalf of uh, the PTTC team, I, again, I'd like to make a shout out for staying on, Yusek Alma Jimenez, uh, Roland Inyon, of course, Judy Ilagan, Arnold Arenas, Alex uh, Arcelias, uh, Edgar Verses, and of course, our E.B. Nestor Palabiab, and all the PTTC staff for hanging on and for joining us and for giving us the support. Once again, we'd like to invite you. On Wednesday, it will be the start of Reboot Philippines. It's Control Biz uh, Reboot Now. They this will be a series of e-commerce programs that we'll be presenting to you through the same uh, platform. But we will still be having a lot of webinars making use of this um, uh, platform of the PTTC. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for this. Thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy.